dear friends uh, let me start by wishing you all a very happy diwali uh, while we celebrate this festival of lights uh, let's be mindful of the looming darkness that will engulf us if we are not able to effectively tackle the climate crisis that threatens us more than ever before as you all know we are in the midst of un climate change conference uh, cop26 we are all listening to the national commitments made by the political leadership in the face of climate emergency where impacts are already faster more intense and with more devastating consequences as flagged in the recent ipcc report this report which was approved by 195 national governments shows the rapid human induced change that is occurring in our climate the concentration of co2 in the atmosphere is the highest it has been in 2 million years sea level rise is at its fastest in 3000 years and arctic sea ice is at its lowest levels in at least 1000 years climate change is increasing the number of disasters and the devastating impacts on lives properties livelihoods and also cultural heritage the likelihood of increased weather extremes such as heavy downpours heat waves and strong hurricanes and cyclones therefore gives great concern that the number or scale of weather related disasters will also increase putting heritage at greater risk than ever before and we have sufficient evidence that points towards this recent devastating floods in belgium and germany and wildfires in greece turkey and italy shows us clearly where we are headed of course while we are facing existential crisis our rich cultural heritage whether tangible or intangible natural or uh, cultural movable or immovable is at higher risk than ever before at the same time greater variability in temperature and precipitation due to climate change is also posing challenges for the conservation of our historic built fabric therefore the protection of our past for the future generation necessitates transformative change through bold decisions for transition to a carbon neutral and resilient world that can sustain heritage for the future generations and at the same time we must consider radical changes in conservation and management practices to adapt to changing environmental context the challenge is huge and may seem out of reach but the only way to address is to commit ourselves towards actions that we can all undertake within our own individual and professional capacity the webinar heritage conservation and climate action building synergies for transformative change organized as part of ecrom lecture series therefore aims at discussing specific actions that we must take at global national and site levels to enable such a change friends i am pleased to introduce myself rohit jigyasu project manager at ecrom and take this opportunity to extend a very warm welcome to our esteemed panelists discussants and attendees from around the world who have joined us today to share their rich and varied experience we hope that this will provide us with inspiration to prepare a more definitive agenda for action within our own constraints and opportunities i am delighted to introduce you to our panelists now and request them to turn on their videos uh, so dr johanna leisner from fraunhofer sustainability network uh, in germany mr peter cox from carrick conservation international island mr cesar bita from the national museums of kenya dr vitia pitun gapu from narisuan university in thailand Mr Jyoti Ganesh Shams Mukha Sundaram from World Food Program and Dr William Magari from Queens University Bel Belfast UK I'm also delighted to introduce you to Dr Rob Woodside from English Heritage who is joining us as the discussant for today's webinar Before I proceed further I apprise you of some procedures for housekeeping during this webinar 
You can send your queries and comments via Q&A icon that you see at the bottom of the Zoom window. We will take up some questions after the presentation and discussion by our panelists. In case we are unable to answer all the questions due to shortage of time, please do send us an, e uh, at, uh, at, an email to us at eprom and we will surely get back to you. So let us start uh, with the first video presentation by Mr. Ali Raza Rizvi, who is the Global Coordinator Adaptation and DRR and Senior Advisor Resilience at IUCN. Uh, Mr. Rizvi is unable to join us in person as he's currently in Glasgow for COP26, spearheading heritage concerns for climate action. Uh, but he's been kind enough to share his video with us. So let's listen to him. Hello, everyone. My name is Ali Raza Rizvi, and I'm responsible for IUCN's global work on climate adaptation and disaster risk reduction. Thank you, Rohit, for this opportunity to speak to the interlinkages between climate change and heritage conservation. Climate change is the immense challenge of our times, as we all know, and I'm sure you all are aware that the 26th UNFCCC Conference of the Parties is currently taking place in Glasgow to determine the next steps to address the climate crisis. But what exactly is the state of climate change, what we are going to do about it, and how it's impacting cultural and natural heritage? The IPCC report, AR6, published in August of this year, is just the latest in a line of increasingly urgent warnings about the climate. As greenhouse gases, emissions from human activities, such as the burning of fossil fuels and deforestation continue to climb, changes in global temperature and other planetary parameters, such as sea level, ocean surface temperature and acidity, and land and sea ice are accelerating. UN General uh, Secretary General called this recent IPCC report a code red for humanity, saying we must act decisively to limit the rise in global temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius and stave off the first effects. As we approach and exceed tipping points in the climate system, we are already experiencing an increase in the intensity and frequency of extreme weather and climate related disasters, including places that have rarely experienced them before, such as the recent heat waves and wildfires in Siberia and British Columbia. Implementation of national commitments under the Paris Agreement in the form of national nationally determined contributions and national adaptation plans is the key to lowering greenhouse gas emissions, stemming the rise in global temperature. Parties in Glasgow are expected to revise their NDCs to increase ambition, and it is critical that they do so, not only to reduce climate impacts on ecosystems, but also on our societies and economies. For instance, a 2020 report from uh, Swiss Re estimated that on the current trajectory of insufficient pledges under the Paris Agreement, the world could see a drop in global GDP of around 10% by 2050. Climate change is a cross-cutting issue for all sectors, societies, and regions across the globe. Cultural and narrative Natural heritage are no exception. UNESCO has recognized that world heritage properties are affected by the impact of climate change at present and in the future. Meanwhile, IUCN's World Heritage Outlook found that climate change is the biggest threat facing protected heritage sites, acknowledges that it can also be part of the solution. More on, the lat on that later. Of course, climate change impacts not only protected sites, but also other forms of tangible and intangible heritage and the environments and communities that surround it. 
the ongoing and future impacts of climate change and disasters on human heritage must not be seen in isolation, but rather addressed through comprehensive landscape, landscape level approaches. We have to look beyond individual sites when thinking about and planning for adaptation and resilience. It's crucial not to just look at the site and do site management planning, but look at the landscape approaches because that is the solution. IUCN strives to take such a holistic approach with global presence in over 70 countries. IUCN is the world's leading organization in nature and ecosystem-based approaches to climate change. IUCN focuses efforts on informing and influencing climate policy and practice. Uh, IUCN has a lot of good experience dealing with threats to natural heritage. In the last five years, we have had 100 projects working on adaptation, resilience, and climate risk reduction. And the learning coming out of it is helping us to better understand and see what's working and what's not working uh, at the broader landscape and communities level. These sites are not metaphorical islands. Changes in the surrounding environment beyond the defined boundaries of a heritage site can and will affect its conservation. For instance, access to heritage sites could be limited through the erosion or blockade of roads due to the landslides or flooding. Wildfires and storms can damage ecosystems and infrastructure in and around sites. Shifts in temperature and precipitation regimes can spur the migration of flora and fauna. Heat waves and cold snaps can harm people and undermine the integrity of structures and natural areas. Some sites like Phoenix Island protected areas of Kiribati shown here are literal islands that are exposed to the impacts of climate change, including coral bleaching and sea level rise. Meanwhile, these changes can also impact the whole supply chain and the movement and availability of people, goods and services with potentially damaging effects on ecotourism and local industries that support the conservation of natural and cultural heritage. At the same time, local people who live near heritage sites and often play a key role in safeguarding them will themselves be impacted directly and indirectly by climate change. Without integrating them into adaptation planning, their resilience could be eroded with negative consequences for their health and well-being threats to local livelihoods and degradation of crucial ecosystems and infrastructure. When we seek to safeguard our heritage, we must also include in our adaptation approaches the people by whom and for whom this heritage is protected. Though cultural and natural heritage could be gravely impacted by climate change, it can also be part of the solution as alluded to earlier. Nature-based solutions and protected areas can build resilience. For example, natural heritage sites provide ecosystem benefits such as water and climate regulation, as well as carbon storage. In addition, the traditional knowledge embedded in cultural heritage can help us build resilience for the changes to come and show us the way to a more sustainable future. Heritage sites can serve as climate change observatories to monitor impacts and test adaptation practices, while also helping to raise awareness of the impacts of climate change. So what does all this mean for the relationship between heritage conservation and climate action? As climate change progresses, our natural and cultural heritage is at risk as are the landscapes and communities that support its conservation. We urgently need transformative change in global and national climate policies, financing and action, as well as in the field of heritage conservation. We need to break silos and mainstream climate change into heritage conservation and vice versa. We need to work beyond individual heritage sites to meaningfully 
include the surrounding communities, their indigenous knowledge, and landscape protection and conservation. With the impacts of climate change making themselves felt today and set to worsen in the coming decades, we must build resilience across boundaries. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry that I'm not here at the webinar due to the Glasgow COP. I wish you a very successful webinar and enriching discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Rizvi, for providing us with a global perspective on heritage conservation in the context of climate change. You have very rightfully said that risks to and resilience of heritage can only be addressed through a holistic approach that considers the landscape context and values the contribution of heritage itself. We must heavily invest in nature-based solutions that can help build climate resilience of our heritage. And it is heartening to note that heritage is actually making a big impression in the ongoing COP26, where there are a number of events around culture and heritage organized, and many of our panelists have been part of those events as well. So we do hope that culture and heritage will find its due position and its due recognition in the climate discourse uh, around the world. Now, I'm pleased to invite our next panelist, Dr. Johanna Leisner, Chair EU OMC Group on Strengthening Cultural Heritage Resilience for Cultural Heritage. German Research Alliance for Cultural Heritage at Fraunhofer Sustainability Network. Uh, Dr. Leisner will be speaking on the assessment of climate impacts on built heritage and also share some examples of adaptation and mitigation solutions that are being developed by her institute through extensive research and practice. So over to you, Dr. Leisner. Thank you very much, Rohit, for this kind introduction. I try now to um, share my screen. Just a second. Okay, and then... Is it working? Yes. Yeah. Welcome and hello to everybody from around the world. I'm really very happy that I have the opportunity today to report a little bit what we are doing in Europe, in the European Union, to protect cultural heritage in times not of climate change anymore. We speak of climate crisis. As Rohit already said, I'm the chair of the EU OMC group, expert group. OMC means Open Method of Coordination, which is dealing with impacts of climate change on cultural heritage. OMC means that it was the commission who asked the member states to send delegates. And they only send delegates to such an expert group if they think that the topic is very relevant in their own home countries. So we have up to now 28 members in the group, 25 from the, from the European Union and three associated countries, which is Switzerland, Norway, and Iceland. And this high number of delegates shows that the topic of climate change for cultural heritage is really very relevant in these 28 countries. But before we go to the work, what we are doing in this EU OMC group, I would like to share with you the, uh, that the climate research has received the Nobel Prize in October. And we are very, very happy that after so many decades of research, finally, it was uh, recognized with the Nobel Prize. And it was the physical modeling of the Earth's climate and showing that the global warming is really caused by the emissions from us humans by fossil burning. And that was mainly done by the equations of Professor Klaus Haselmann from Hamburg. And what you can see here, the two globes, you, we have seen already the presentation by Ali. Um, these two globes, um, 
where you can see the two different emissions future possibilities. On the left side, it is the globe. When we reach the Paris Climate Agreement, you will see the global temperature increase until the end of the century. And on the right side, you can see if we do business as usual and we change change anything, we will uh, see a global uh, temperature increase of about 8 to 10 degrees by the end of the century. And what that means for us, I don't need to explain further to you. I only want to recall that the fever thermometer from human beings stops at 42.5 degrees because then our proteins degrade. And that has a tremendous effect on us human beings, on our health, but also on the cultural heritage, on the built heritage, on the materials, because also materials are suffering from the heat and from precipitation and many other climate factors. Well, I'm also very proud uh, to um, report that it was the European Commission in 2003 which launched the first call for a research project to deal with climate change impacts on the cultural heritage and it was the project was called noah's ark it started in 2004 and with 10 partners and they were investigating but using a global climate model to see what are the impacts of climate change on the built heritage but also on cultural landscapes that was the impact on the outdoor heritage using global climate models. But in cultural heritage, we need more high resolution data from the global climate models in order to know what is happening at your specific site. You want to know if you have a castle or if you have an old building or if you have a historic garden, what is the weather and the climate in the future looking like? And for this, we need high resolution climate models. And that was developed in the second project of the European Commission, where I was myself the coordinator, and it is called Climate for Culture. And we have been developing together with the partners from the Max Planck Institute of Meteorology. There were the PhD students, the former PhD students of the Nobel Prize winner, Professor Hasselmann, who have developed for the Climate for Culture team a regional climate model for the entire of Europe, including the Mediterranean Sea and Northern Africa. And we have looked especially into how we can combine the regional climate model together with whole building simulation tool. And then we could see how will the indoor climates in historic houses will change and what kind of impact it has on the collections we have stored and displayed inside because much of our heritage is also displayed inside in museums, in historic houses, in archives. And finally, we also could calculate what will be the energy demand in the future in museums and historic houses for a sustainable indoor climate until the year 2100. And here you can see our result that means that was only for Europe. We need a little bit less energy for heating, but we need much more energy for cooling. And we need more energy for dehumidification because it was reported also by my um, by Ali. Uh, we will see more precipitation in some regions and we will see a global increase in temperature, especially in the northern part of Europe. And uh, up to now, cooling and dehumidification are very expensive and still we have to find for this type of measures climate neutral uh, technologies. In our group, EU group, expert group on climate change and cultural heritage, we have started in January, we have tried to collect examples, best practice examples from all over Europe. And I can tell you, it was very, very difficult for the delegates to find the respective um, best practice examples. And we could gather up to now only a few. And that shows us that we need much more um, better initiative to start planning this kind of measures, how we can adapt and also how we can mitigate 
um, the climate change effects. And here you can see an example from Germany. It is a, a castle together with a historic bark. And they were suffering by heat and drought and they have a decrease of groundwater level. They had already to fell a two, more than 200 ancient trees. What they are doing right now, the project also started only recently and it is still ongoing. They try to use and test climate resilient tree species. They want uh, to install innovative maintenance of trees and soil improvement, new irrigation system, and also they are promoting the biodiversity. And as it was also said by Ali, we always have to think cultural and natural heritage together, because mostly, as you can see here, ancient and uh, historic buildings are surrounded by uh, historic gardens or cultural landscapes. And what they have also done is they are now using a renewable raw material, which is a special type of grass. It's called Chinese reed, and they use it for a glass heating plant. They are using photovoltaic systems and uh, to uh, operate the electrical system and machinery. And also they are using natural shading for the building because that is one of the most uh, CO2 free uh, ways to keep the heat out of the building. Another example I like to uh, introduce to you is for example from Austria. And here they have tried in an old um, historic building to reintroduce the old air cooling system from the 19th century. And that also helps to reduce the heat in the auditorium and they are saving carbon dioxide. Another example is from the city of Bordeaux. It is a world heritage city. And here they have started to uh, set up new urban planning regulations. So that means it is obligatory if they do changes in the historic city. And here they have tried to install thermal insulation of buildings and revegetation of courtyards to fight, for example, the urban heat, because in a, in cities, we have, according uh, additionally to the normal global warming, we have these uh, heat islands. And that means inside these historic cities, often it is much hotter than it is, let's say, in the surrounding uh, parts of the city. They have invested into maintaining the biodiversity and thus improving the well being and health of the citizens. And they have also, when they develop these measures, they have incorporated the needs of the residents. Another example, which is still going on in France, next to Strasbourg, uh, to Bordeaux is Strasbourg. And here they um, are planning to be finished in 2022. So you can see that we not only need, uh, let's say measures for the cultural heritage, but we also need the support of the legal framework. That means that in the planning phase, it must be obligatory to take climate change into um, consideration how and also uh, respecting, of course, the laws to protect cultural heritage. Another example is from uh, Scandinavia, it is from Norway. They have invested into the refurbishment of old historic houses, how much CO2 they can save. And here you can see an example from a villa in, in Norway that they could save 67% uh, of reduction in total greenhouse gases emissions over 60 years, introducing new technologies for the protection of old and historic houses. The same was also done for other historic houses in Norway, where they really could show that it also financially is a benefit if we invest into the upgrading of historic houses to make them climate fit. My last examples come from training and policy development. And here you can see the uh, project, it is from uh, Croatia, but the, this kind of dry stone walling you can find all over the Mediterranean Sea. And here they have re 
recovered this dry stone walling and they were training the young people within this research project how to make such a dry stone walling and that also shows that we need also to address the younger generation we need to make them interested in protecting the cultural heritage from climate change impacts for their own future and livelihood Another example is also again from the Scandinavia, and that is about the intangible heritage. And here they have used the knowledge from the reindeer husbandry, how to tackle with climate change. And they use the knowledge of this traditional uh, people and together with scientific knowledge, how we can address the vulnerability and how we can analyze and what we can do to mitigate at least a little bit. Yeah, so uh, our first results from this EU group is what we already heard. Extreme climate events and gradual climate change are affecting all kinds of heritage. But we still have a lot of gaps in understanding and knowledge about climate change impacts. For example, how do the climate, uh, the heritage experts get the climate data? What kind of formats do they need? So here we really have to work together. And we will need still more relevant data. For example, how much CO2 can we save if we invest into the refurbishment of old houses? And also we need to invest into overcoming the lack of awareness about the urgency to adapt um, against climate change. And that exists on all levels. We need to collaborate all over the world. And we need also a common entry point or observatory where we can find all these information about climate data, about the best practice example to get inspired from other countries, from other continents. We need to invest into people, into skills and training. We need people in the heritage management, in the planning phases, who have the knowledge about climate change and cultural heritage. And still, we need to integrate cultural heritage protection in times of climate change into the mainstream policies of EU member states and on the member states level. And that shows also the work of our group is not the case for many of our member states. For example, in Germany, cultural heritage is not mentioned in the national adaptation plan to climate change. So here still we have a lot to do and we hope that in COP26 we make a significant progress. And um, let's join our forces all over the globe. And thank you very much for listening and keep in touch with me and send me your best practice examples. Thank you and stay safe. Thank you so much, Dr. Leisner, for sharing such inspiring examples that demonstrate for sure that we can in, indeed achieve climate neutrality in foreseeable future uh, through measures such as use of uh, renewable raw materials and electrical operation of machinery and equipment, training and capacity building. I mean, we need to work at different levels, as you showed, and we need to work in different capacities at our own individual level, at the national level, at the regional and the global level. So it requires this work at multiple scales, at multiple levels, and you have clearly brought that out. The outcome of your study also shows, and, and that's very important, I think, for all of us to learn that upgradation of historic buildings indeed make an economic sense contrary to the general perception, and we need to explore more into that area. Uh, so thank you again, Dr. Leisner, and we look forward to our discussion in the, uh, as we uh, move forward in this webinar. Thank you so uh, much, Rohit. Thank you. And now I have the pleasure of requesting Mr. Peter Cox, conservation scientist, founding member of Carrick Conservation International Limited, and a member of Ecomos Ireland who has held many important positions in Ecomos in the past. And Peter, through his presenta presentation, will further elaborate on creative approaches to sustainable historic buildings. To, so over to you, Peter. Thank you, Rohit. Um, and sorry, I'm just, um, am I sharing my screen yet or? Uh, no, we are. No, okay. Sorry, just give me one second. Um, 
I keep forgetting to hit the uh, share screen button. So, um, and it was very uh, interesting to um, listen to um, Dr. Weiser. Uh, and uh, there's a synergy <laughs> which is uh, well placed uh, by Rohit, I'm sure, when he was inviting us all to speak. Um, I'm going to look uh, very quickly, and unfortunately, seven minutes isn't a very long time, but um, I'll try and give you an overview. Uh, at creative uh, approaches to sustainable buildings. And this is the area that we're working in mostly, uh, not only within ICOMOS. Uh, I'm past president of the ICOMOS International Scientific Committee on Energy, Sustainability and Climate Change. And, um, but my company in private practice is also doing this. We have three divisions. Uh, I won't go into those too much. What I'm going to cover today is some um, products and data, education, the need for education and knowledge and tools, malad adaptation, which is uh, a side um, kind of a threat from climate change. And then understanding carbon in the built environment, a study which we did for Historic England. And uh, I show a couple of case studies and a few other documents that we've been involved in. And the link to the Fraunhofer uh, Institute of Building Physics um, under Dr. Ralph Killian. Um, and they have got a building in this wonderful complex of Benedict Boyron. Uh, and we've created a live laboratory where we're testing materials. And this building dates from about 1720. And we took the um, rather sad lime render off the outside and we've done four different external lime renders one with hemp one with cork one with a product called aerogel and one with just pure lime and we're monitoring these uh, on an ongoing basis the performance and we're finding that uh, particularly the lime hemp and lime cork is showing about a 33 35 percent improvement in u value the aerogel is phenomenal. It's showing about 70, 74%, but it's quite expensive as yet. But, um, and then uh, we're using the, the pure lime just as, as a kind of a, a, a baseline. And internally, we've done a number of internal insulations and different heating systems, different, um, and we're monitoring all the uh, relevant. And the beauty of working with someone like Fraunhofer is they do uh, really put every widget in there to, to, to get all the information. And this is a phenomenal kind of live laboratory that we're, we're working with. And uh, at the end of it, we want to show this as a showcase, as a, actually an exemplar uh, system. We uh, did a, a gap analysis for the Irish government on skills and training uh, within deep energy renovation of traditional buildings. And this showed us that there was a real big gap in uh, knowledge and skills. And we then uh, devised and ran a lecture series which was uh, 10 modules and we kind of estimated that we might get 60 to 70 people within two days of releasing this we had 120 which was the maximum that we could host in the building and luckily this was pre-covid so we did it in person we're now looking at doing this perhaps uh, on on um, on virtually um, and we're looking for partners in that. We also work very closely with the UK Centre for Moisture and Buildings. And I can't emphasize the importance uh, of en en energy renovation and moisture related risks, because if we put a lot of modern materials onto our old breathable uh, buildings, we are creating health risks for the um, people that live there, as well as not meeting targets and um, actually not reducing uh, CO2 emissions. The STBA, which is a, a, a British uh, organization, the Sustainable Traditional Building Alliance, um, commissioned the design of a, of a tool called the wheel. And we, we find this really is very, very good. Now, obviously, 
<coughs> it, it was designed a couple of years ago and we're learning all the time. And I believe the STBA are now looking at maybe upgrading, but it is a tool that can be changed uh, and it's very useful. I was involved with the Central European Standards Committee um, on uh, EN 16883 in 2017, and it was signed by all EU states. And it's a matrix or, or it's a prescriptive, um, sorry, it's, it's a kind of a, a system rather than prescriptive and a system. And this is quite a good chart to, to base uh, decision making on, on uh, whether to. Uh, do uh, you know? Do certain elements of, of interventions or not? And um, these are some of the things that can go wrong, uh, where they slam external insulation on this a uh, nineteen hundred building, and within uh, within about seven eight months, the owners had to leave the house and had to pay about three times the cost to actually rectify what was done, and this was all done. Uh, under a grant system from a local authority, which is is really uh, troublesome and, and really it, it's a great threat. The study that we did for uh, Historic England to understand carbon in the built environment, we looked at a case studies and, and again, Joanna um, kind of mentioned this, that the lack of data, the lack of good examples are just not there yet. And this is something we need to really push and to uh, have some sort of centralized uh, sharing details. But we carried out this and we looked at uh, a number of case studies. And what we did was measure the, the CO2, uh, including the embedded um, or embodied carbon within that building as it was today. Um, and then we did a light energy upgrade and measured the uplift in carbon. And then we did a, a deep renovate and um, and measured the carbon and then we virtually demolished the building and measured the cost of that and the outcome was quite scary and um, that to re replace an ordinary house uh, will take 63 years to pay back the carbon um, that uh, you're getting rid of basically and that's designing a low carbon and NZEB, uh, to me, is a kind of, um, I think we need to move on from that. That was all designed in relation to operational carbon. And what we really need to include in, uh, particularly for the built environment, is uh, the embodied carbon uh, that is so important. And the conclusions were deep energy um, efficient uh, refurbishments uh, were necessary and can be done. Um, but... Uh, a light energy retrofit is probably car carbon wise the best thing to do. We found a lack of an LCA, a life cycle analysis tool that is designed specifically for existing buildings. Um, and then we found the lack of EPDs, which is environmental product declarations. And they should really become mandatory so that every manufacturer gives you an EPD that you can actually calculate the amount of carbon from kind of cradle to grave, as we say. Um, <clears throat> just some of the um, adaptive reuse. This was a church that uh, 1720s again in the center of Dublin. It was uh, it, it kind of went out of use in the 1960s and in the 1980s, some kids broke in and set fire to it and it was burnt down completely with just the four walls and the chancel still standing. And uh, we took that and developed it into a modern office block. Um, and we put in, uh, we use natural ventilation from the crypts underneath. We uh, have solar panels on the roof and we use geothermal and this now performs at a very high energy efficient rate and it has won a number of awards. Other documents that we've been involved in is climate change sectoral plan for built and archaeological heritage for the Irish government which is now part of the major uh, national adaptation framework uh, which is actually quite a, a, a good document. Um, the SDGs really are coming into their own and, you know, several of them relate to cultural heritage and 
uh, climate change and energy efficiency. And we need to perhaps keep this on the agenda as well. Um, <clears throat> I hope to get to this, but I don't think it will be in my lifetime that we have uh, the police stop carbon crimes of de demolition of very good buildings. Um, but so that's it. Thank you very much. And if anybody needs to contact me, please do. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. Uh, you have shown so many examples that have, uh, that have demonstrated how deep energy renovation and risk management of traditional buildings can in fact go a long way in achieving climate mitigation. And also the response uh, retrofit guidance we that you introduced is indeed a very useful tool that can be applied and tailored to a variety of contexts. So uh, thank you very much for sharing these very, very inspiring examples. And I'm sure there's a lot for uh, us to really learn from them and, and uh, work in our own context. So thank you again, Peter. Well, thank and, you, Rohit, and thank you for the invite. Thank you. thank you very much. And please stay for the discussion uh, uh, later. Uh, now, we all must be thinking that, uh, well, climate mitigation or adaptation is only a thing that happens in developed part of the world. And that is a misconception. A lot of inspiring things are happening in the developing world as well. And we have an example that we are very proud to show you for where we have uh, the pleasure of inviting Mr. Caesar Vita, who is an under underwater and marine cultural heritage scientist and head of the Department of Coastal Archaeology at the National Museums of Kenya. And he will be telling us about his ongoing project in Nida Creek in Malinda. And Mr. Vita will be telling us how communities can be engaged for addressing climate change issues in heritage sites. To over to you, Mr. Vita. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Rohit, for the invitation to participate in this uh, important uh, climate change forum. And uh, it's my pleasure to bring to you what we are doing in Kenya and especially with the local communities here in the coast. Uh, I'm going to take you through a project that we are undertaking at the National Museum of Kenya uh, with the support of uh, um, rising from the Deaf Network from the UK and in which we are collaborating with the local communities uh, to conserve heritage and also to fight the impacts of climate change. Uh, the project itself is located in a, in a creek of the sea, uh, north of Mombasa town, about um, 150 kilometers away. And um, it's an area that's populated with less, about 35,000 people. And this area itself has a lot of uh, uh, vulnerabilities and is uh, exposed to serious climate change uh, problems. We have been experiencing icy, icy level changes. Uh, there's been serious uh, encroachment of the sea into farms where uh, the local communities are getting affected. And uh, the creek also is a protected um, marine, marine area with uh, forests of mangroves and uh, uh, marine life. You find that uh, the area is exposed to the sea and some sections of uh, the creek have got mangroves and others, the mangroves have been washed away uh, by the sea because of the rising, the rising tides. Yeah. So there are extreme climatic changes where historical sites and monuments and cultural sites of the local people are being taken away by the sea. So the tides, you guys, as you can see from the illustration there, you can see the mangroves dying, you can see the sea encroaching into people's farms. And this problem has led the people to start thinking of ways of uh, how they can best overcome this problem and how best they can counter and ensure that uh, the land is protected from the ever rising sea level, which is today unimaginable. There's serious algae bloom now being washed from under the sea and it's being brought to the farms. And this is also killing uh, plants, not only uh, cash crops or crops found for food, but also uh, trees that are growing 
uh, near the shore. So when they bloom, the algae comes and dries on the on the on the on the, on the, on the base of the trees. These trees tend to dry up. There are prolonged dry spells and the serious erosion of uh, of the farms due to the sea sea rise. Then how do we, how do the communities here uh, address this problem of the climate change? Through the rising from the depth network that supported this project, uh, National Museums of Kenya then uh, sought to work with the local people in this creek. And the idea was to bring together researchers and stakeholders and also to talk to the local people and educate them on the fragile heritage resources within the landscape of the creek and then see how best these local people can counter the problem of climate change and what ideas they have and what knowledge do they have. We also sought to bring together the people themselves to ensure that they understand the problem that is facing them and to try to find a way to motivate them economically because these people are poor and they need to have an opportunity for them to make a living. So how do we turn around the problem of the climate change so that they can be motivated, they can find that they have the interest to move in and start uh, mitigating the problem of climate change. So we had a series of meetings with the local people where you can see women, the youth, and then we brought together researchers from the different institutions of the government that uh, have a stake at the creek in, uh, in Malindi. We worked with the, and we are working with the Kenya Wildlife Service, which is a state agency in Kenya. We are working with the Kenya Forest Service. We are working with the Kenya Forest Research Institute because these are institutions that uh, they have a stake at the creek. The marine, the Wildlife Service, they are in charge of the marine park, which is the creek itself is also part of. And the Forest Service, in charge of the mangroves, which are also part of the ecosystem within the creek, and then the research institute for the forest, and, the, and then the administration of the region, which is the county government. And a number of non government organizations also came to support us and working with them towards uh, ensuring that we can find a solution with the knowledge of the local people. So we took uh, uh, researches with the communities and with the universities to find how the local people are able to to counter the problem. So what we realize is that, what we came to learn is that the local people have a lot of knowledge on climate change. It might not be that scientific as that we discuss in, in, uh, in uh, professional forums, but they have their own indigenous knowledge that how they can adapt and how they can, they can, they can take charge, how they can take charge of their problems. So we sat with them, we train them on uh, the current problems and we ask them to identify the problems that they're facing and how best they can, they can, they can counter this problem. And this is where we realize that actually these people have a very, very rich knowledge about, about climate change and the issues of cultural heritage and how they can mitigate and how they've been trying to mitigate these problems. And then how they can invest in uh, initiatives that can motivate them to, to want to keep fighting climate change in their, in their, in their, in their, in their area. And we, we know that the impact to this involvement of local people is, 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 is huge. Because environmental sustainability, mitigation and adaptation, there are things that these people know. But only that we as experts, sometimes we don't, we don't go to them, we don't ask them what is best for them. Normally, when people will come and impose things to these people, instead of coming to talk to them and asking them, how best they feel these problems can be can be can be challenged. So resilience through cultural heritage and climate change are things that we put together so that we want to protect the heritage and we also want to fight climate change. So we package the cultural heritage and make a profit out of it so that the local people can make money out of that and they have the motivation to want to work harder to ensure the climate change, the, the climate impacts do not reach the cultural heritage. The problems of the sea do not come to the cultural heritage because it's for the cultural heritage that they are able to make uh, economic development. So these are our partners. You can see rising from the Red National Museum of Kenya and the local community itself that we worked with and the University of Krista from, from where we had researchers to, to, to collaborate with at the National Museums of Kenya. And from this 
uh, initiatives that we created with the local people, they invited and organized national and international events to plant mangroves within the creek so that they can counter the sea level. In a number of events that have been organized and planted so many seedlings of the mangroves in the area. And we have more than now five acres of land that has been reforested with mangroves. We also partnered with local government and national government to ensure that there's follow up of what we do and ensure that within the mangroves themselves and the local people can invest in beekeeping, they can also invest in butterfly, butterfly farming and accrue some interest from the mangroves themselves. So they'll want to come back and see how their mangroves are doing, how the butterflies are doing, how their, their, their honey is, is, is growing. And this way, they'll want to work harder and ensure that there's more trees planted within the creek. So we created a resilience and proper reduction through climate change and want to catch heritage. We look at what these people are doing, the fishing side that they're employing, and how the fish is being affected by, by the climate change. Then we adapt to traditional styles, which, which are better and adaptable within and sustainable within the creek. So now the local people can get more fish, the local people can invest in, um, in beekeeping, they can invest in butterfly farming, they can invest in ecotourism through a number of initiatives that are created and they can manage these, these, these initiatives themselves. They can make a living out of it. So they want to go and fight climate, climate uh, effects so that it doesn't affect their businesses. So today they have set up nurseries of, of uh, mangrove seedlings and they are selling these seedlings for reforestation. So all the events that relate to uh, reforestation of the creek they buy the seedlings from the local community. And at a small fee, the local people is able to make a small living. So they will come every day or twice in a week to look at the seedlings and plant more seedlings. And in this way, the creek is now getting better managed. The impact of climate change is now reducing. The local institutions of the government that are working with the local people, there's no closeness. They have become friends with the local people because they find that the problems of climate change is affecting the local people and the local people understand how best they can face these challenges and they have the knowledge that they can apply. So the experts, the local experts are now working the local communities to take advantage of the knowledge of these people. And the local people now are also making a living out of it. So you can see the cycle is supporting mitigation of climate change. So from this uh, research and from this uh, project that we are undertaking, we have noted that the best practices to employ in promotion of climate change and resilience is to get to the local people. Let's, let's leave the boardrooms, let's leave the conferences, let's leave the offices and come to the local people, talk to them, see how best we can adapt and that we can use their local, their local knowledge and how best they understand the problems because the issue of climate change is not affecting only those people living in towns. This problem is affecting people on the ground. And these are the poor and minority communities. So we employ community science. We involve them. We incorporate the indigenous knowledge. We train them. And then we use the local trainers themselves to train their own people. This way you realize that there's a lot of buy-in from the local people. They'll want to work with their own people. They'll want to work with us because we understand their language, we understand their culture. So it is important as experts to consider adoption of some of these community practices so that we can effectively fight climate change and sustain, sustainably utilize vital and cultural heritage. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Bita. Thank you. Uh, your rich experience from the field has actually brought out the importance of bringing together researchers and stakeholders and most importantly, the community who is the real, uh, real uh, uh, owner of their heritage to play a role and raise awareness on the fragile heritage resources. Also, uh, you have very aptly emphasized on the need for fostering economic opportunities, social cohesion and well-being for ensuring that our inter interventions are sustainable, which is really the key for us. So thank you again. Thank you for bringing this case uh, to all of us. Our thank next you. panelist, is Dr. Vitiya Pitun Gunaku, uh, who is the Associate Professor of Faculty of Architecture, Art and Design at Narasuan University. 
and is also the director of climate change adaptation for cultural heritage preservation and co focal point of sokothai uccn thailand so dr vitya will be presenting the case of world heritage historical park of sokothai so over to you uh, dr vitya hi hi everybody good evening uh, uh let's i share my screen um yes i hope you can see all my screen now all right okay uh, i'm witchia from narayson university in thailand and uh, i have to thanks to ecroms and professor rohit that never left me walk alone <laughs> yes uh, and i'm glad to join you all of you today and i'm willing to share about the climate adaptation as the future challenge of the cold thai heritage site and uh, this is the location of um, the site, heritage site that I will present and share with you today. As you know, Thailand is a rich country in a natural setting and cultural heritage site as well. And we have like three uh, World Heritage Center, World Heritage Sites, which is one in the north eastern part and one in the central next to Bangkok. And uh, the site that I would like to present with you today is the Koh Thai Heritage Site, which is located next to uh, Narasun University campus and in the Pisner Lok province. And if you see from the photograph here, you will see that Thailand is a culture of living with water. And we learn how to live with water in you know, uh, different periods of time. And um, you will see how the architecture, the town planning, even the heritage buildings, the ancient city and temples were decided along with the waterscape. And also we learn how to use the flow of water to balance you know, the, during the dry season and the raining season. And um, the main mission of our research unit is try to push, you know, climate adaptation into the cultural heritage site as well. And this is the location of the Kotite um, heritage site. We see located not far from Bangkok, it's about 400 kilometers. And you will see uh, it's not only Sukhothai be our uh, first kingdom, but it also the first era of art and architectural styles. And uh, the city, including its uh, associate towns, um, have been designed at the World Heritage Sites in 1991. And you will see how important of the uniqueness of uh, the hydraulic system, which consists with the extensive literal war, the network of moats and canals that linked the three associate towns together, uh, you know, between Sukhothai, Sachinalai, and Gampang Pet. The ancient city itself uh, managed the water flow based on the gravity uh, seen edges to manage, to balance, to keep, to store the water you, during the dry season and flow it uh, during the rainy season as well. Then the city is very, well planning with the watery system. But unfortunately, due to the land use change, the rampant urbanization, uh, together with the increasing impact of climate change, the watery uh, systems of the ancient towns is no longer uh, functional with the climate change recently. As you will see, that uh, this photo represents the Loi Gatong Festival, which is held in Sukhothai every year as the top five, uh, which attract um, more, nearly a million tourists um, join this festival every year before the COVID. <laughs> and also you will see this festival Thai people will pay respect to the goddess of water, but over the last half decade, the city fed with the shortage of water and uh, we need to supply and pump up the water to retain it in uh, this reservoir in order to allow Thai people to conduct that beautiful festival. And uh, this is the, a bit, um, the way of living of the Thai people, how they adopt and adapt uh, themselves, you know, to fit with the dry season, you know, uh, to live with water during the rainy season and to live without water during the dry season and you will see either from the heritage sites itself and also from the wave of living that the popular noodle soup of Sukhothai, Thai, even the stir fry dry noodle app we call Pad Thai, which is quite popular around the world. 
but it's not only about the local wisdom that we need to um, work on because uh, in case of the push climate action into cultural heritage is still an issue, not only in Thailand, uh, I think it's in uh, either in developing country and developed country also we need to concern on the process, how we make a connection between the climate change and cultural heritage, you know, for achieving the sustainable city and communities. It doesn't only how to um, provide the resilience environment, but we need to empower the local livelihood also to enhance that local uh, even knowledge and skill. And also participation from all stakeholders are very important to push planning into practice, I can say. And in case of the so Thai and the heritage sites in Thailand, uh, in the past, because of uh, the sites uh, authorized under the Fine Arts Ministry, uh, I'm sorry, Fine Arts Division, which is belong to the Ministry of Education, before its move and reform to be uh, authorized under the Ministry of culture, then the main mission of the science management focus on the quality education. And uh, this is a challenge for us as well, how to push the unlucky number of SDG 13, climate action to be a lucky number for achieving the uh, sustainable city and community to protect and preserve our natural and cultural heritage in more resilient future is the challenge. And also, um, I think it's very important to, to note that uh, it's not only tangible and intangible heritage that we should work together. We cannot separate the people from the place and we need to engage them to involve with the climate mitigation, climate adaptation, because um, when you think in global challenge and the climate change issue, we need to push it into you know, local action as well. That's why we need to maximize their local wisdom, indigenous knowledge, along with the affordable, I, I use the word affordable technology in case of Thailand, in order to integrate climate change into the cultural heritage sector, not only in terms of the world heritage, but the value of the local heritage as well. That is the thing that why we are together today, because we expect that the cross multidisciplinary collaboration is very needed to broaden our aspect of practice. And the key takeaway today, uh, I challenge you all uh, to think about, shall we resist the nature and its phenomena, or how might we learn to live with them, as I believe that together we can. Thank you for your attention. Right. I'll stop sharing now. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Vidya. This was very insightful presentation. Through Sukhothai case, you have very convincingly brought out the importance of learning to live with risks and adapting to local context rather than always trying to fight against them. Uh, indeed, the integration between different sustainable development goals is crucial to make cultural heritage count for adapting to the climate change, as you mentioned. And this requires us to really break the silos in which we work. And that kind of uh, inter, uh, intercoordination is really, really the key for the success of our initiatives. So thank you again. And thank our you. next- Thank you. Thank you. Our next esteemed panelist is Dr. Jyoti Ganesh Shanmukha Sundaram, who is a regional technical lead for climate and weather related risk and PRISM Institute at World Food Program Regional Bureau in Bangkok. Uh, Dr. Jyoti is going to tell us how to use climate and risk management lens for guiding future climate change adaptation planning. So over to you, Dr. Jyoti. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rohit. And uh, thanks everyone. Uh, good afternoon or good morning to wherever you are. Uh, so I'm very happy in this uh, webinar with this distinguished panelist and really fascinating talks going on. So um, what I'm going, uh, okay, let me just, uh, finish my introduction. Uh, um, myself, Jyoti, I am working with World Food Program in the Bangkok office, mainly focusing around understanding the risk uh, in terms of uh, supporting data analytics that supports decision making in the context of uh, uh, climate risk understanding or uh, adaptation planning or disaster risk directions. So uh, having said that, uh, so today I'm going to present about uh, 
my past work around climate risk management uh, uh, to understand the past for the future adaptation planning. Actually, the uh, is designed together to make a photo. Like all the small pieces are important, uh, whether in terms of uh, experiences from different parts of the world, which we are learning from various uh, speakers around the world, or at the different levels or scale, which uh, Rohit also mentioned, like a community or national level or a global level. So we are getting a spectrum of area of uh, uh, talks covering all these areas, they are all very connected. It's as, as some of the speakers already mentioned, they are all interlinked and uh, it should be actionable by the community. So it's very important to understand the past uh, in terms of climate and how the climate affected the people uh, in terms of risk and how people adapted to those uh, climate that requires a collective understanding and ownership from the community. Uh, that's how they were able to manage whether it's a successful practice, what we learn from, what we see from the past. So that the same can be uh, inferred or uh, uh, interlinked for our, uh, that can guide for our future adaptation plan. Having said that, uh, let me move on to my next slide. Okay. So um, we are looking from the present, uh, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, traditionally we are looking at the past for the immediate, like uh, say 20 years or 30 years, or, because we don't have data for the uh, long past. Of course, we have experiences, traditional knowledge, history, and there is a, a subject, paleoclimatology, which can all, which can guide you to know or infer about the past climate uh, from the process. So there are ways to uh, look at immediate as well as the distant past. So that will provide a holistic idea on what climate was and what was its risk and how people manage the risk. Because people live, our very essential uh, existence is due to its adaptation at different stages, uh, thousands of years uh, here there. Uh, managing the climate risk. And we are also observing the present. And we have uh, also models, climate modeling, and our uh, distinguished speakers and all mentioned about uh, climate modeling and efforts to understand uh, the dynamics of the Earth's climate system, which helps us to understand what the future climate is and what are its associated risks. So, uh, what I'm going to present is combining the science and the traditional knowledge, how well we can understand the immediate and distant past, as well as uh, the future climate and how it, the past experience can guide for the future adaptation plan. So as I mentioned earlier, there are different ways to uh, infer uh, climate at different time steps or time scales. Uh, basically, I'm a climate geologist, so I look at climate information at different scales. For example, uh, 19, after 1980s, which is a satellite era, we have satellite products, some, uh, we have high resolution climate products, which will say uh, what is the climate and uh, what are the extreme events, trends, everything uh, for the last uh, 40 years. And before that, we have uh, instruments, uh, basically the weather stations, uh, the equipments which can uh, people were observing and that can provide uh, information on climate. So what happened before 1,100 years, uh, for several thousand years, there are ways to infer, for example, uh, the natural observatories, for example, trees, which has its rings, which says about the drought or uh, how much stress it observed connecting with the climate characteristics over hundreds of years. So. Uh, so for thousands of years uh, back, so we have so many ways to uh, infer the climate through the process, uh, through the paleoclimatology science. And as I mentioned in the future, we have uh, uh, climate modeling, so where we can infer the climate information. So this is about the science part. So uh, Sam said that, uh, so we have a rich of history in every part we hear from uh, 
around the world like uh, today also uh, our previous speaker mentioned about the monuments and uh, water management uh, strategies practiced in thailand i have i heard uh, many examples throughout the world uh, in terms of mayan civilization and also uh, sin civilization there are a lot of experiences and uh, angkor wat uh, uh, the cambodia one so the, the one i'm going to present is from the south east in india so the how uh people manage climate risk uh during the medieval climate anomaly uh 8321350 c during this period uh many historians documented uh or uh, uh the shrink of the civilizations or uh, abrupt uh, collapse due to, and uh, many of the paleoclimatologists and historians worked together and then identified the coincidence of the this medieval climate anomaly and drought phenomena and the shrinkage of the civilization and things like that so uh, during this particular interesting period uh, uh, a civilization uh, was started uh, growing faster and constructing lot of water harvesting structures and heritage sites so this was a very uh, interesting question when the surrounding areas are uh, suffering through the droughts how particular area has rich lot of water and uh, planning to build lot of water harvesting structures and uh, monuments in the same uh, period so that's when uh, we looked into the uh, paleo climate uh, and then uh, we got to know that Uh, there is a phenomena which is called uh, el nino which you, many of you might have heard and it is commonly associated uh, with the drought in asia uh, but it also brings a heavy extreme heavy rains and extreme rainfall events in certain parts of uh, asia um, so that's what uh, the southeastern india and uh, parts of sri lanka are heavily influenced by this uh, northeast monsoon as well as this is uh, linked with the selino phenomena during this particular period there were lot of enso elino events which were linked with the heavy rain so the people started building water harvesting structures but traditionally they are semi arid regions dry areas um, but they built lot of harvest the, whatever the pictures you are seeing as it's a different water harvesting structures the one is the lake it's a man made lake and the second one is the smaller level uh, ponds uh, with the uh, heritage sites and the third one you are seeing is a large man made dam to regulate water for uh, agriculture so uh, all these uh, were built by the the civilization as a coping mechanism to adapt with the climate risk because they lived with the climate they know how it impacts so they adapted to the climate uh by building water harvesting structures and moreover it is the semi arid region so whatever water they can harvest during the wet season which comes in uh, two three wet spells which can supply enough water for the dry season uh, for the next six months so this is how they manage the risk and uh, another important point i want to make here is the commun it's community owned and uh, and until it is community owned at least the systems are functioning well it was even helpful for the uh, the mega drought uh, during 1876 to 78 so the still the core uh, civilization uh, survived during the droughts with all this uh, water harvesting factors but unfortunately uh, the misuse or disuse of the systems and less ownership of the community uh and deteriorating of the structures lead to catastrophes and the people uh, started suffering uh, uh from the climate shocks but uh it is very important that uh, the future climate also indicates that more extreme events are increasing and it is not only the climate and some of uh, the speakers already mentioned about the changing landscape because the impacts are felt it's not just because of the increase in the climate uh, extremes it is also the combination of the uh, the livelihood and the changing landscape so uh, but uh, whatever the systems they built thousands of years back so it served beyond centuries uh, it was built with such vision so it was uh, very helpful 
So what we need to take into account such examples, and again, it is all localized knowledge. It has to be implemented with the localized context. But what we can uh, infer is how people lived with this risk by uh, uh, in the past. So that can be uh, taken forward for the future adaptation planning. Uh, but recently, I am seeing a lot of interest from uh, the government as well as the various donor agencies on uh, reviving these water harvesting structures. And I see some projects are ongoing, uh, which I noticed through the newsletters, like uh, Thousand Tanks in a metropolitan city, which is the capital of uh, a state which hosts, uh, which is almost, uh, I think, uh, 10 million people uh, are living there. So for the future climate change impacts, it is uh, very important to act and also increase the community understanding about the climate risk and ownership on all the adaptation activities. So uh, with that, I will uh, end my presentation with uh, key messages. Uh, consider not just immediate past, but also the distant past. And the second point is uh, consider not just climate and risk, but also the risk management options, how people followed in the past. And third is consider thinking about solutions, not just for addressing the known or expected risk. So we should not isolatedly see the pieces. For example, if you prepare for floods, what will happen if drought happens? So all of our actions should be interlinked. Uh, in the past, they have devised something which can address both floods and droughts. So that's what I want to mean that uh, our solutions should also address the unexpected risk to sell the society beyond uh, centuries. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jyoti, for your presentation, which has clearly highlighted that we can turn risk into opportunities by utilizing traditional knowledge that has accumulated over time. Uh, you have also very importantly uh, advocated for solutions that consider uh, uh, addressing unexpected risks to serve the society in the long-term perspective. So these are very important lessons that we must uh, keep in mind. So thank you again for your uh, enlightening presentation. And now, uh, last but not the least, uh, it's indeed an honor to have with us Dr. William McGarry, uh, who is the ECOMOS focal point for climate change and cultural heritage, and is also senior lecturer in archeology span and uh, Queen's University, Belfast, UK. Uh, Dr. McGarry will speak on the lessons learned from the application of climate vulnerability index at two heritage sites in Africa. So over to you, Dr. Magari. Uh, great, thank you very much, Rohit, for that lovely introduction. And um, it is indeed a great pleasure to be with you here today and also to hear the great presentations of, um, of, of our colleagues, which we've heard so far. I certainly have been learning um, an awful lot. Yes, yeah, so hello everybody and greetings from Northern Ireland, which is where I am based. As Rohit said, I am by training an, an archaeologist based at Queen's University in Belfast. But since September, I have been the ICOMOS focal point um, for climate change and cultural heritage. And it has indeed been a very, very busy few months to be taking over that mantle with the current Conference of Parties um, meeting in Glasgow and everything else that has been going on. So over the last few years, I've also been principal investigator on a number of projects exploring climate change uh, and cultural heritage, uh, including projects which look at the topic of, of heritage and climate communication and uh, the topic of what I'm going to talk to you about today, um, which is how we assess the vulnerability um, of, uh, of cultural heritage sites to the impacts of climate change. And, and to do that, I want to present uh, just some lessons that we have learned um, over the last year from our most recent project, which is called the CVI Africa project, which is actually currently still ongoing. We, we've been, the project has been running for the last um, 11 months and we've been able to achieve really, really quite a lot considering everything that's been happening um, around the world. And, and what I want to do is briefly introduce the project um, before focusing on four key lessons that I think ourselves in the heritage community and especially hopefully many of you listening today uh, can take away from this for thinking about vulnerability at your own sites. And I should stress that this is not just about cultural sites, these lessons uh, transfer uh, across all types of sites. So before I get into the CVI Africa project, let me start off by just explaining 
the methodology which is central to this project, and that is the Climate Vulnerability Index. Now, this might be familiar to some people um, listening today, um, but it was developed by two of our friends and colleagues, Dr. Scott Heron and Dr. John Day, um, from James Cook University, um, and it was initially envisioned as a tool for natural heritage. Um, however, uh, it's been picked up by the cultural heritage sector as well in recent years, and it's essentially a rapid tool for assessing the vulnerability of sites. And what it does is it provides an assessment of low, moderate or high uh, for their vulnerability. Now, it's a tool that was initially designed to look at specifically at world heritage sites and the statement of outstanding universal value is often the first place that it starts from. But what it does is it identifies the unique heritage and socioeconomic values of a site and then works with in-country climate scientists to identify potential risks to these values. It then balances these against the adaptive capacities of the sites, both physically and also of their associated communities. And to date, the CVI application has only been applied uh, to sites in Western Europe and Australia, and the CVI Africa project was the first time and that it was applied to properties um, in Africa. So in short, then, the project is about it was about exploring the vulnerability of African world heritage properties to climate change. Um, and we work very closely with our projects on partners on the ground, uh, specifically Tawa and Tanzania and ICOMOS Nigeria in Nigeria and the African World Heritage Fund, who were lead investigators on this project that was myself and several others. The project had two key deliverables. The first was training and six heritage managers and professionals were chosen from over 300 applications and from across the continent to take part in a 10 week training course on climate vulnerability, which was based on the CVI process. And they came from Cabo Verde, Kenya, Nigeria, Tanzania, Tunisia and Uganda. And following the completion of this course, two CVI workshops were held at World Heritage Sites in Nigeria at the Sukur Cultural Landscape, and that happened in September uh, 2021, just, just two months ago, and then also at Tanzania at the World Heritage Site of the Ruins of Kilwakisuani and the Ruins of Songo Minara, and that workshop was actually only held a couple a couple of weeks ago, both of which were hybrid events with substantial participation uh, locally um, uh, from local stakeholders, uh, with other people joining remotely over Zoom like we're doing now. So then, uh, I, am, I am at heart a teacher, I am a lecturer, and so I'm always interested in what lessons do we learn from this, uh, these experiences. And the question here is that after 10 weeks of, of training, including hundreds of hours of expert presentations from Indigenous knowledge holders and climate scientists, heritage managers, community stakeholders, uh, people talking about case studies and stories and discussions, and then also followed by two intensive workshops in Nigeria and Tanzania. What did we learn from a process like this of relevance to us all today when we're thinking about the vulnerability of heritage sites? Well, like I said at the start, I would like to, for the remainder of this presentation, focus on four key things that I think we can do immediately um, to think and assist in climate action. The first thing um, is establishing what is at risk, or in short, sometimes we call this, what makes your site special? This is a value mapping exercise. And so some sites like World Heritage Properties will have a statement of significance or a statement of outstanding universal value. And this can be a very useful place to start in thinking about what are the key values of the site. This is because identifying these key values really is central um, to identifying and understanding potential impacts. However, it's also important to be as inclusive as possible, and we're not included in statements of significance or statements of outstanding universal value, to engage widely to identify other social or economic values which are relevant. So for example, sites like mosques or churches may be of both heritage values and of religious values, and both may be impacted by climate change. And this is why values need to, be, need to be accompanied by attributes, which are both tangible and intangible, which manifest and speak to these values. 
So this side of the slide you're seeing now um, contains an example from the CVI we did at Kilwa Kisawani. The SOUV of the site, so the Statement of Outstanding Universal Value, identifies archae the archaeological remains and deposits as being a key value. So that's our key value. Uh, in this case, the tangible remains themselves attest to this value. So these are the attributes which attest to the value, the tangible remains. And so if these attributes are destroyed or lost, that aspect of the OUV may be damaged or lost. And that allows us to think about the potential impacts. Lesson two is to engage with climate science to fully understand how these attributes may be impacted. And we sometimes call this making friends with your local climate scientists. And it's been great today to hear so many uh, examples of how climate science is feeding directly into our planning and how we do things. But overall, as a sector, I think we are very familiar with certain types of risk, but we often talk about them in quite general terms. So, for example, we often hear references to sea level rise and its risks to coastal archaeology or heritage sites. But actually, climate risks and climate impacts depend on a range of factors, and we need to understand these better. A key factor here is scale, because while climate predictions are often regional, impacts are often felt locally. And so there is a need for downscaled climate models, and this takes specific expertise, which is not readily available within the heritage sector. And it's also impossible to explore these impacts based on the different emission scenarios and over set timeframes. For example, while our leaders this week in COP may be aiming for low emissions in the future, most climate, models, mo most climate modelers are expecting a more business as usual future based on emissions like RCP 4.5 or RCP 6, um, which see temperatures increasing by more than the 1.5 we're hearing a lot about this week. In fact, some of the most despondent are looking at even more extreme possibilities. So what the future looks like is not set, but when we think about adaptation planning, we need to be clear on what variables we're thinking about. And within this, timeframes are also important because the timeframes of climate change and climate impacts should align where possible with current management plans. Vulnerability assessments based on situations at sites 80 years in the future may in many cases be less useful um, than say thinking about impacts by 2050 or by 2060. And the image on the screen here shows both local climate temperature uh, projections and changes in precipitation events under different emission scenarios for the site of Kilwa. So downscale predictions based on emission scenarios and established timeframes will identify which climate stressors pose the most risk. The next step is actually to see how these stressors may impact the key values identified in lesson one. To continue with the example of Kilwa, because I think we started there and it makes sense to go on, we identified the archaeological remains as both a key value and a key attribute. Based on a climate impacts report written by a Tanzanian climate scientist for a specific emission scenario, in this case the most extreme 8.5, um, and assessing vulnerability until 2060, two um, impacts were identified and these were coastal erosion and increased precipitation. The final lesson then is to work out what your resilience gap is. Uh, this will allow you to identify um, what the adaptive capacity of your site may be. Now this term resilience gap is used in a range of contexts here, but in brief, potential impacts should be understood in terms of a site's ability to adapt to or respond efficiently to them. So a Kilwa, for example, the impact of coastal erosion on archaeological deposits are significantly reduced by the presence of coastal barriers like the one shown on the slide and the many mangroves planted around the coast. This means that while coastal erosion has the potential to cause a significant loss of value, in reality these sites' adaptive capacity minimizes this impact significantly. So those are the four lessons I want to speak of today. Um, and I hope uh, that you have found them useful. The CVI Africa project 
has had lots of wonderful partners from around the world, in fact, from four continents, which made meeting up quite challenging, um, but really has been an excellent example of how global solidarity and partnership is key to climate action. And I'd also like to thank the people who funded our project, which are the UK Arts and Humanities Research Council and the Department for the Digital Culture, Media and Sport. So thanks very much. Over to you, Rohit. Thank you very much, Will, for bringing forward these four key lessons, which were very clear, and they really uh, inspired us to think about actions at site level uh, drawn from your experience. Uh, indeed, we have to have a clear understanding of heritage values, uh, climate stressors, understanding current and potential impacts, and as you said, work out the resilience gap. So thank you very much for, for your uh, presentation. Uh, let me uh, thank you uh, all of you once again, uh, all of our panelists for the stimulating presentations. Uh, before I take up uh, questions from the audience, uh, I would like uh, Dr. Rob Woodside, Conservation and Estates Director of English Heritage, to briefly reflect on these presentations and also share his views on the priority areas for making climate action for heritage a reality on ground. So over to you, Rob. Thanks, Rohit. Um, I hope you can hear me. Just I'm jumping between screens here. Right. Um, well, firstly, um, yes, hello, I'm Rob Woodside, I'm Director of Conservation Estates at English Heritage, and I'm also the Chair of the UK Historic Environment Forum Heritage and Climate Change Task Force. There's a lot of words to say. Uh, I may talk about that a little more in a moment. So um, I think we've covered a lot of ground in some in very short time. Um, these presentations clearly demonstrate the, the breadth and complexity of climate issues and the need to bring together our understanding of science, research, policy, as well as community engagement, training and communication to, um, to result in really effective practice. Um, I hope I can pull out some of the, the key points we've just heard. Um, Ali gave us a really big picture, um, the risk to climate change from cultural heritage and the need to take joined up approaches to dealing with the problem. Heritage doesn't exist in isolation. Uh, and we need to consider the interrelationship with nature and people uh, as we work our way through this. Johanna illustrated the very broad work undertaken by heritage scientists, researchers across Europe to understand what the changes in climate mean to heritage sites. And I know that the Noah's Ark report has been truly uh, influential um, in shaping our understanding of risk and mitigation. And now, now that's really great to see how it's feeding through at heritage sites across Germany, Austria, France, Norway, influencing policy, design, practice, and how we need to put this in the heart of our work. Um, we've heard both um, creative and practical solutions for energy efficiency and historic houses from Peter, and the need to adapt different approaches and materials. But also some salutary lessons about getting it wrong, um, and just illustrates the importance of skills training. And I think the, um, the findings as well, in terms of your research, Peter, the, the work that what you flagged up saying it would take 63 years to pay back the carbon from demolishing and rebuilding an existing traditional building. It's just the sort of insight we need to make the case for conservation, maintenance and effective rectifying. Um, Caesar gave us insight to how grassroots community engagement can support critical nature-based solutions. And it's also just how critical to, to uh, it made the point really clearly how important it is to, to work with local people. They know the sites and they know the issues better than all of us. And we need to make sure that we have really meaningful and open dialogue with them. And it's not, and consultation is not telling people, it's listening. It's really finding out how, how their knowledge can really be applied to some very challenging situations. And I like the, the, the call to action there, Caesar. get out of the office, get talking to people, get it, do it on the ground. Um, we, we can't do this uh, in a sort of just a one either professional academic sphere. We have to do it closely with communities uh, as we can. Uh, Wutea, well, firstly, what wonderful sites you work with, uh, some serious heritage en envy going on here. Um, you remind us of the issues we face are not always directly related to climate change, but also the impacts of changes in land use, urbanization, infrastructure, and possibly even mass tourism as well. And then what you did is you brilliantly brought the focus back onto the sustainable development goals, raising our eyes to think of what the big picture is and how culture plays a part in a much broader agenda for sustainable living. Uh, Roti Ganesh expanded our minds with explore, exploration of time. 
um, and how people in the past have learned to uh, manage uh, limited resources and changing climates and how we might use that understanding, that, that knowledge of how people lived in the past to shape our own actions into the future, known or unknown. Uh, and finally, Will, a man who's got his work cut out for him as ICOMOS focal point for climate change, uh, gave an overview of the Climate Vulnerability Index. So I'm, I'm familiar with that and the, its application and the Orkney World Heritage Site. Uh, I think it's great, I'm a bit of a fan. Um, so it's also great to hear how it's now been applied and tested in completely different environments. And what you're putting together and presenting to us, Will, is I think a, a really transferable tool um, that can be used in all manner of sites um, around the world. And I think that's um, that's going to be an enormously uh, valuable um, tool we can all use. The question is, how can we roll this out quicker? So um, I think what these presentations illustrate are the complexity of climate change issues and the need for truly interdisciplinary working. Uh, we all have to take into factors um, into account from deep science and research to meaningful and inclusive grassroots community engagement. No one aspect is enough because climate change is not a single issue, but the lens through which we have to consider all our work in conservation and heritage management. Understanding risk and vulnerability and the independency of cultural, social, economic and the wider environment should shape our work now, not sometime in the future. So we need science and research to reform policy, and we need to learn from practical experience. But we also need to listen to diverse voices, people living on the front line of climate change, uh, taking a truly holistic views of cultural values, bringing together the top down with the bottom up. And we have to show how heritage and culture can be a positive force, not a barrier to mitigation or adaptation. And we have to work together to build our adaptive capacity, our ability to understand and reduce risk and act. The reality is that heritage and climate change is still a relatively niche area. Um, so how do we make this mainstream? How do we make this absolutely core cool to what we do, not just something on the, on the periphery? Um, I just want to quickly mention the work that I've been involved in through the UK Historic Environment Forum, which is a grouping of, of um, uh, national organisations and government bodies um, uh, coming together around COP26 to develop a, a essential a statement from the heritage segment in the, in the UK. And we just produced a report uh, called Heritage Response, where we recognise the, the physical, social and economic uh, environmental impact of climate change and cultural heritage. We also wanted to show how we be, could become part of the solution. So that covers, again, like so much we've heard today, you know, case studies about great research, innovation, advocacy, decarbonizing the heritage sector, supporting communities, championing nature, improving energy efficiency, and investing in training and skills. So um, I hope after this, I can um, send the link for that round just, just, to, just to share what we've done. But I think just want to end my bit now with, with some of the, the, the key points that come out of the document, and I think are reflected in this, the conversations and the presentations we've just heard. Firstly, we really need to commit to this. We need to transform how we work, being open to change and investing in the research, training and skills development to make this happen. We must collaborate. None of us can do this on our own. Um, and there's a power to working across our sector, across disciplines and across nations. Climate change knows no boundaries, and nor should we. And we have to communicate. It's, it's good that we talk to each other. We have to do that. We also need to make our case to governments, to funders, to the communities we serve to show that heritage can be part of the solution. So COP26 is now, but let's not make that just a moment of time. Let's make that the beginning of something new and take all this experience we've heard today and apply it to how we want to work in the future. Over Thank you. you so much, Rob. Thank you for such beautifully uh, summarizing uh, all these uh, discussions and also giving us a kind of a, a vision for where we should look for uh, investing our energies uh, in the near future. So thank you once again. And uh, I would request you to share the link for the publication you just mentioned in the chat box for everyone. So um, now uh, we have received actually so many questions and comments that it's just impossible to cover. Uh, but I'm going to take just a few of uh, these questions. Uh, 
so let me start very uh, quickly with the first question. Can you please elaborate? This is for Peter. Can you please elaborate on how you chose the materials for the line uh, renders you have been monitoring? Do, uh, do some of these come from traditional methods used in the region? Uh, so Peter, over to you. Thank you, Rohit. Um, I wouldn't say they're traditional, although um, you know there is evidence of um, various substances being added to lime renders in, in ancient times. Um, so this is really kind of taking that uh, kind of original knowledge and, and perhaps trying to do uh, new things with it. The problem we have, um, uh, you know, uh, and Rob alluded to it as well, is, is maladaptation. If we put modern materials on an old breathable building, we're going to strangle that building, we're going to entrap moisture, and that moisture will then find its way inside the building and it'll start creating a mold or, or some sort of organic material that is then detrimental to the health of the occupant. So what we've tried to do is, is to take materials that we know are breathable and therefore allow, and that's the whole thing about allowing moisture in and out. And, um, you know, cork allows moisture to go in and out. Uh, hemp does as well. And aerogel was a kind of a, 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 an odd one, but it was designed by NASA to um, kind of insulate the um, capsules coming back from space. And they come through enormous temperatures. But there is a company now actually exploring the manufacture of that in a more easy way. And I suppose the analogy I give is that, you know, uh, when I got my first mobile phone, it was a briefcase and it cost about two and a half thousand pounds. <laughs> now you can buy one that fits in your, you know, you lose in your pocket uh, for, for 10 pounds. So we hope that it's going to become and, and part of this is also as, as a, a test, you know, as I say, it's a live laboratory where we're monitoring the performance of these things. And if we find something isn't working, then obviously we'll highlight that and say it. And we're also working with paints as well because other people go out and paint their building um, and then that's an unbreathable paint or, or doesn't allow the moisture and traps these. So, um, it's important to, to be cognizant of the science and how we want our buildings to perform. Thank you very much, Peter. So the next question is for Caesar. Uh, Caesar, uh, as the question is like, as a young person, how would you encourage or advise us to get involved with organizations and research units that look at heritage and climate change. So just uh, one of the young person is asking for your uh, advice on this issue. Hello, uh, is Cesar around? Okay, if, uh, if he comes back later, we will take that question. But let me uh, go to Johanna. Uh, Johanna, are you there? If Johanna is around. Uh, yes, I'm there. I'm oh, sorry, okay. it took a bit All right. longer. Johanna, so the question is, um, would it be possible to explain what are the criteria uh, that were used to select best practices? Oh, the, there were not uh, too many criteria because uh, we have uh, developed a template and we collected, I mean, we asked what is the contribution to fight against climate change? How was a CO2 reduction uh, uh, taken into consideration? So we had a template. I can send it around. I can send around this template and uh, we practically took everything we could get because we have not received uh, really many of these best practice examples. As I said, it was very difficult to collect it. And secondly, all the members of this EU expert group are doing it um, uh, voluntarily. This is a, vol a job which is done next to our normal work. And, um, and thirdly, we have no register, no forum, no observatory where we can easily access this kind of uh, information. But the template for how we gather these uh, best practice examples, I can send it to you, Rohit, and you may um, forward it to our colleagues here. 
Of course, sure, uh, we'll do that. Thank you so much. So uh, the next question is, um, maybe I will uh, ask this question to Will. Uh, Will, can you share your thoughts? Uh, what kind of skills and capacities are being required among heritage practitioners to make stronger and meaningful transdisciplinary climate actions? Uh, in order, uh, uh, so how can capacity building gaps be better covered at earlier education stages? So if you can answer that. Thanks, Rohit, um, and, and thanks, Paloma, who sent this question. I think this is such an important, an important question. It's something I feel really passionate about. And um, I'd also like to just before I answer that question, um, acknowledge I just received a, a message from the wonderful Mercy Robla, who's the site manager at Kilwakisawani. And had I known she'd be joining me today, I would have asked her to present with me because she was so instrumental in making the whole project work, especially at the site. I think carbon literacy and climate literacy is a key thing, uh, both in the heritage sector, but also before we get to that point. So I, I teach in third level and um, my students come in with a pretty good understanding of, of the general aspects of climate change, but very little understanding of the science behind it. And one of the things that we are doing this year in my university in Queens um, is pioneering climate and carbon literacy training for all our first years in the whole university. So we're starting off with a small cohort and we're going to insist that that's done across the board. But we also, I think, as educators need to incorporate it into every aspect of what we teach. So I teach a module on the archaeology of islands. Um, and of course, islands are uniquely impacted by climate change. But there are also very interesting uh, examples of adaptation in marginal environments that can come in. And so we're encouraging, we're and, and mainlining in all our degree programs, a climate change thread that runs all the way through all the modules we teach. Now, I think we probably need to even go back further than that to high schools and to primary schools and things as well. But I think climate literacy in professional context needs to become a part of our CPD, of our continual and professional development for all people in heritage. Because unless you really understand the science and the nuances of what's happening, it's very difficult for us to adapt properly to it, right? And to make the decisions which, which we need to make. So yeah, I really, I, I think that, I mean, Rob made a very interesting comment that the climate heritage and what we're doing is still somewhat of a nuanced area. And I think he's right, but I think we have to change that. And I think we've heard that today across the board. We've heard several clear calls that this is not something that, that, that we can sit on the sidelines or just bring in specialists to deal with. I think we need less levels of climate literacy uh, and, and knowing how to react embedded really in everything we do, because it touches on everything we do. And um, so that's my thought. Thanks, Rohit. Thank you very much. So I come back to Caesar again. Caesar, the question was from a keen young person who is asking, how would you encourage or advise us young people to get involved with organizations and research units that look at heritage and climate change? So some words of inspiration from you, please. The best thing to do is to love your heritage. That would be the first thing. You ought to love heritage. And if you love heritage, you will want to be involved in protection and uh, its uh, conservation, absolutely. There are so many organizations. Uh, there are so many activities that involve the youth. For example, what we do in Mida Creek, we involve uh, the youth. We work with them. We go fishing with them. We support the activities. There are so many organizations that uh, the youth have got to be involved in. But uh, key is, in fact, um, getting involved, getting the interest to participate in these things and uh, loving your, 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 your heritage. That comes as number one. You know, we do have problems with the youth nowadays who they want to be so, uh, they don't want to see at home. In fact, they don't want to be involved in these, uh, these activities that are down there. They just want to go in town. They want to be involved in high tech things. But there's so much potential in cultural heritage. There's so much potential in um, things that are there with you in everyday life. So get involved, support the, the, the community initiatives and uh, love what they do and be part of them. Thank, Thank you. you very much. That was very clear message from you, Caesar. Uh, there's another question, uh, which is, uh, I will just say, we are at risk of losing a lot of cultural heritage in Zimbabwe due to wildfires, almost seasonally, some infernos are man-made, as in the case of Matobo Hills, World Heritage Landscape, which is well known for prehistorical rock art sites. 
but no studies have been done as to how these fires affect the conservation of such heritage and any ways to curb this effect of climate change. Are there some similar things uh, elsewhere? Could you please refer them? So this is a kind of a question uh, which I would just pose to any one of you who would like to respond uh, to this kind of a practical kind of question that is being asked. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you so much. Well, uh, I think um, we all know there's a lot of pressure in this world. There's so many problems in this world. People have got a lot of um, problems to economically, they want to make a living. And there's pressure with the population expansion and the, the land is limited. So there's, there's no more land that we have. So there's that squeeze of people, population is growing, families are growing bigger every day and they want land to farm. And then here is a piece of land, it's a, it's a piece of monument, it's a piece of cultural site, which is not, is, is not being utilized. And then maybe the people who are working there, they have not involved the local people. So there is a disconnect between, between the heritage experts and the local community. So they see this is it's not ours, we are not part of it. We are not managers of this site, you see? So there's no way they will love it, they will like it because they are not involved. But if you bring them on board and discuss with them how best can we manage this site, this is our heritage, this is where we can make a living, then show them ways in initiate in, um, development projects that involve the local people and show them how they can make a living out of that, that particular cultural heritage. They will love it, they will support it, and they, there will be no fires, my friend. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Caesar. So last question I'm asking is to Dr. Jyoti, uh, how can we uh, reconcile heritage with technological advances? Uh, future yeah. modeling is one example several of the panelists talked about, including you. Are there any case studies or projects where technology has been used as a mitigation measure alongside indigenous solutions or indigenous practices? Uh, so yeah. uh, maybe you would like to reflect on that. Yeah, yeah. thanks. I think it's an excellent question. Uh, so definitely technology plays a key role uh, because we have models, we have earth observations, uh, because uh, the computers with the effective models can do number crunching. And for example, we know in a city how many people are living and we have a water harvesting structure, like how much water can be stored if certain amount of rainfall occurs in such landscape. So all of this, all of this is possible because of, because of the technology advancement. We have digital elevation models based on the earth observations. We have land use, land cover, uh, maps generated and, uh, and we have precipitation data sets uh, using earth observation. So a lot of technological advancements help us to understand the problem and design solutions for this problem. Uh, the projects which I mentioned uh, for the Chennai metropolitan city, I, I assume there must be a lot of scientific uh, modeling done before they've gone for the project approval phase. For example, they do thousand tanks and they have defined the capacity, how much uh, people are living there, how much water demand is there. So all of these can be done through the models. That's what the technological advancement helps. But what we infer from the past is the experience, but to adapting to the, the current context, we need a lot of data, information, models, which, can, uh, which technological advancement can help us. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jyoti. So I think what you said is really important that we need collaboration between researchers, practitioners and community. I mean, this really comes out very strongly with, with all the presentations that have been done. And I would pick a quote, which was also very nicely said, make friends with your local climate scientist. I think this is a great lesson for heritage professionals, because I think we really live in our own little world. So we need to kind of cross that little uh, well and look outside. And that's very important as well. So thank you again to all of you for your uh, responses. Uh, there are so many questions. It's impossible to take all of them. We'll be keeping, we'll just keep on uh, continuing this webinar for the rest of the day if we continue with, uh, with uh, these questions. But uh, it just shows that there's a lot of interest. There, there's a lot of need to do many things at different scales, as I've been mentioned. And uh, so thank you all of you once again. I take this opportunity also to mention that ECROM has fully committed itself uh, towards addressing this global issue in various programs and activities. Recent ECROM has joined IIC and ICOM CC in committing to lead transformative action within cultural heritage sector. 
in response to the climate crisis. Our three organizations will work together to reduce our emissions while mobilizing an international coalition of sustainable sustainability initiatives to help world reach net zero by 2050. ICROM also actively contributed towards the Rome Declaration of the G20 Ministers of Culture that strongly calls for climate action for heritage. Uh, and I would like to request my colleague to show the screen. Uh, in January 2022, uh, ICROM will also organize uh, an, international, uh, uh, an international conference climate culture piece which will take place in, um, in January uh, next year as part of the program titled First Aid and Resilience in Times of Crisis. Uh, integrating climate action for reducing disaster risks in world heritage properties for building resilience is one of the key thematic focus of ECROM IUCN's World Heritage Leadership Program. Uh, we have contributed towards drafting the update of the policy on climate action for world heritage properties uh, that will be presented for adapt adoption during the General Assembly of UNESCO later this month. And last but not the least, under our prospective program of sustainability and built heritage, we are integrating concerns for climate change in our international training course on conservation of built heritage. So uh, before concluding this webinar, I would like to once again express gratitude to all the panelists and also our organizing team here at ECROM that has been working hard to bring these webinars to you under these exceptional circumstances. We also thank all the attendees uh, for participating in the webinar and staying on till the end uh, and uh, also raising such important questions. The recorded version of this webinar will be shortly made available on your YouTube channel uh, linked to our website. Uh, please note that the recordings of the previous webinars uh, are also available at ECROM lecture series uh, page, so you can go there and check them out. And information on our future webinars is made available at our website under ECROM lecture series and other social media platforms. Uh, please watch our next uh, webinar titled Rethinking Textile Conservation that will take place on 25th November and you will find the link for registration on our website, www.ecrom.org. So thank you for staying with us. Thank you to all the panelists uh, and discussants and uh, all the participants once again. Please be safe. Uh, goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.